today, the name Louis Vuitton is synonymous with luxury fashion. The illustrious fashion brand creates a variety of items, including luggage, handbags, clothing, and accessories that are used and worn by some of the most wealthy and influential people on the planet. And with a current net worth of $431 billion, it's safe to say that the business has been wildly successful not only in its influence in the world of fashion design, but also financially. But what many people don't know is that this billion-dollar company has an incredibly interesting origin story, and it starts with a young homeless boy on the streets of France. Louis Vuitton was born in 1821 in the rural town of Anchay, France. But unfortunately, his early life was not easy. By 10 years old, he had lost his mother and was living with his father and stepmother. Sadly for young Louis, his stepmother fit the stereotype to a T and was extremely hard on him. Life with his stepmother was challenging for the adolescent, and so Louis decided he would leave Anche behind and make his way to Paris in the hopes of a better life. He was only 13 years old at the time, and as Paris is 300 miles from Anche, you can imagine the long and hard journey that the young boy had to undergo to get to the City of Lights. It took Louis two years to make this somewhat miraculous voyage. As he had no money for his transportation, he took up odd jobs along the way, already showing his aptitude for hard work and discipline. But by the time he arrived in Paris in 1837, he still didn't have a penny to his name. The young boy was homeless, alone, hungry, and lost in the city. Though, as we will come to see as we continue this tale, young Louis Vuitton was incredibly resourceful and the beginnings of his success were not far off. Although Louis was so young when he left home, he still learned the value of hard work on the farm and took it with him to Paris. As farmers and millers, his family was always impoverished and had to work for everything they had. So when he arrived in Paris with nothing, he knew exactly what he needed to do, get to work. Luckily, Paris and the world at large was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution in 1837, and there were plenty of jobs to be found around the city with the influx of transportation and manufacturing. Louis quickly got a job working for Monsieur Marchal, who at the time was an incredibly successful trunk maker. One of the reasons why Monsieur Marchal's trunks were being purchased in mass is because of the Industrial Revolution itself. For the first time, long-time travel had become accessible, and the people of France needed well-made and durable luggage to transport their belongings with them on their adventures. And at the time, luggage was considered quite the status symbol. Not only were the containers expensive, but if you owned one, it also meant that you could afford to travel on a regular basis. Monsieur Marchal's trunks were durable, meticulously made, and well-liked by Parisians especially the upper-class citizens. And during Louis' time working under Monsieur Marchal, he learned the ins and outs of the case-making and packing trade. In just a few short years as an apprentice for Monsieur Marchal, Louis had become one of the best trunk makers in the business. And throughout the following decade, from 1842 to 1853, Louis made a name for himself, not only with his manufacturing skills, but also his ability to correctly and conveniently packed the trunks full of valuables, and it wasn't just in the industry that he was gaining notoriety. He also made important connections with the Paris elite. In 1853, when Louis was 32 years old, he was hired as a personal luggage maker for the wife of Napoleon Bonaparte, the Empress of France, Eugenie de Montijo. This event was truly life-changing for Louis and it gave him the ability to strike out on his own as a successful trunk designer, maker, and packer. And the very next year, Louis finally left the shop of Monsieur Marchal and opened up his own storefront on the streets of Paris. Throughout the 1860s, Louis' shop, which had a sign that stated, securely packs the most fragile objects, specializing in packing fashions, was extremely successful. But Louis' ambition was not wasted on simply mastering the trade. He had an innovative mind that drew him to design, instead of just production, of the status quo. 
In his eyes, there were two main problems with the current patterns of popular trunks. They could not be stacked, and there was no way to secure the belongings inside the containers. Eventually, he would find even more issues that could be solved with a little imagination. But for now, he set his sights on finding the solution to these two. The trunks being produced from the 1840s to 1860s were made from leather. However, as leather is not particularly waterproof, the design included a rounded top so that water could easily flow off the container without leaking into the interior. While this system did work to keep the traveler's possessions dry, it created one major issue. The containers couldn't be stacked. Therefore, when attempting to pack the trunks on a train, very few could fit into one compartment. And it took quite a bit of effort to pack them safely, which was time-consuming for the attendants. To combat this conundrum, Louis designed a trunk that had a flat top. However, as leather wouldn't function properly for this pattern, he decided to use treated and waterproofed canvas instead. Canvas proved to be easy to work with and functioned perfectly for the new and improved trunks. So the next step was securing the belongings inside. The solution he found was incredibly simple. There would be divisions within the container to hold specific items in place. However, even though his creations and storefront were considered extremely successful for a few years, things didn't go exactly as planned for Louis. In 1870, everything changed for Louis and the city of Paris when the Franco-Prussian War broke out. During the war, Parisian residents, including the Vuitton family, needed to evacuate the city and live in camps on the outskirts. With little food, the survival rate was abysmal. However, while Louis and his family made it through the one-year war, when they returned to the city, the trunkmaker's workshop had been looted and essentially destroyed. With no workspace, storefront, or even tools to work with, Louis had to start from scratch. Luckily, he still had a fantastic reputation and got straight back to it. He opened a new store at One Rue Scribe, as well as a residence and workshop on the outskirts of the city, and business picked back up. And Louis was so successful in the years following the war that he was able to open a workshop in London, England, expanding his company internationally. While Louis's old designs were the fan favorite of the Bourgeois, he decided to step up his game and create a new line in 1872. This line was still made of canvas, but instead of gray trianon, he dyed the material a rich brown color and embossed a pattern in gold. This design would eventually become the Louis Vuitton signature pattern. But even before it was iconic, the richest people in Europe, including the royals, couldn't get enough of Louis's newly patterned luggage. At this time, Louis also used his skill set to work on a new product, handbags. During the 1870s, handbags were not popular among Parisian women. They were seen as cumbersome and attractive. But Louis changed the game when he created canvas handbags in a variety of styles to suit the many elegant outfits of the Paris elite. Louis Vuitton's handbag designs are still used today, not only by the company itself, but by inspiring thousands of other handbag designers. In addition to the popular new aesthetics and creations, Louis also focused his energy on another common problem, security. The locks being used on the trunks of the time were extremely easy to pick, and many valuables were lost to theft. After some experimentation, Louis finally invented a theft-proof lock in 1886 with the help of his son, Georges. This lock absolutely was a historical breakthrough. His trunks were now completely safe from theft. In fact, Louis and Georges asked the great and famous Houdini to attempt to break into the lock to prove its validity. And when the magician couldn't pick it, the lock gained even more acclaim. These unpickable locks are still used today on the company's bags, making them not only safe, but also retain the classic look Louis envisioned. Throughout the 1880s, Louis realized that his old age made it challenging to work all day in the shop. But luckily, his son Georges showed an aptitude for the family business and became his father's apprentice. Although the visionary continued to work until his death, realistically, Georges had taken over as the master of the studio. Georges proved to be almost as excellent a designer and businessman as his father, and the company continued to be successful under his care. 
When Louis Vuitton finally passed on February 21st, 1892, Georges continued his legacy and expanded the already international business into the United States. He continued to use his father's name as the official name of the company. And although the company has grown into far more than just a family business, it remains simply Louis Vuitton. When Georges Vuitton passed away in 1936, he left the company in the hands of his son, Gaston Louis Vuitton. He ran Louis Vuitton well for 50 years, and during his reign, he began creating leather bags again with the signature patterns of his father and grandfather. Over the past 150 years, Louis Vuitton has continued to grow into one of the largest and most successful luxury fashion brands in the world. And while, of course, the designs and production have adjusted to the changing times, Louis' original patterned luggage has remained one of the company's most beloved products. Along with this extraordinary story, Louis Vuitton's iconic designs, iconic creations, and innovative ideas will not soon be forgotten. Hungry for another fascinating business story? Click on the following video to hear the crazy story about the son of a manufacturer who created Christian Dior.